So welcome to everybody and greetings. Um, my name is Catherine Hellerstein and I'm the Ruth Meltzer Director of the Jewish Studies Program at Penn and I'm a professor of Yiddish in the um, Department of Germanic Languages and Literatures. On behalf of the University of Pennsylvania and the faculty um, of the Jewish Studies Program, as well as the Department of Germanic Languages and Literatures, I'm really delighted to welcome you to the 36th Joseph Alexander Colloquium. The Joseph Alexander Colloquium is the Jewish Studies Program's oldest endowed lecture, lectureship. Over the past 36 years, it has become one of our real institutions, an intellectual touchstone, and a highlight of the Penn Jewish Studies academic year. This year, due to the pandemic, again, for the second time, we're holding the Alexander Colloquium on Zoom rather than on Penn's campus. Um, we can only hope that in the coming year or so, we will be able to convene again in person. But the advantage, there are many advantages to Zoom as well, um, which we'll maybe talk about later. The colloquium was established through the generosity of the Joseph Alexander Foundation and the Mackler family, specifically by Helen and Alfred Mackler in memory of their late brother and uncle. The Macklers are longstanding loyal friends of the university who have been among the staunchest supporters of the Jewish Studies program since its inception. And I'm especially happy to welcome on the Zoom call, Harvey Mackler and Randy Mackler Windheim, who's I think not able to be here because she's working right now, but who plans to watch the recording of this uh, session later and other members of the family. All of us in the Jewish Studies program very much appreciate the opportunity that the Mackler family has given us to join together to explore issues and share ideas on important Jewish topics within a scholarly forum for the benefit of the Jewish Studies faculty and students of the university community and of the larger Philadelphia. And I think today we could say maybe national and international communities. Today's lecture also is co-sponsored by my home department, Germanic Languages and Literatures, along with the Jewish Studies Program, um, as this year's annual Kristallnacht commemoration of the 83rd anniversary of the Night of the Broken Glass, the anniversary of which was yesterday, November 9th, 2021. I want to thank Chrissy Walsh, the administrative coordinator for the Jewish Studies program, who is hosting and managing the Zoom format for this talk and has done a lot of work behind the scenes to make this happen, as usual. Over the past three and a half decades, the Joseph Alexander Colloquium has brought many distinguished speakers to Penn, including political scientists, scholars of Yiddish and Hebrew literature and culture, medieval and modern historians, and, eth and ethnomusicologist who revived Klezmer, a prize-winning culinary scholar, and others. Today's speaker for the Alexander Colloquium continues this distinguished line of scholars on Jewish thought, culture, and history. Susan Neiman is director of the Einstein Forum, born in Atlanta, Georgia, she studied philosophy at Harvard and the Freie Universität Berlin and was professor of philosophy at Yale and Tel Aviv University. Her books, which have been translated into many languages, include a whole, no, a huge number of them, including Slow Fire, Jewish Notes from Berlin, The Unity of Reason, Rereading Kant, Evil in Modern Thought, Moral Clarity, A Guide for Grown-Up Idealists, a book called Why Grow Up, um, and um, Ein Manifest uh, in po Post-Faktischen Zeiten, a manifesto in post-factual times, if my German, my Yiddish mm -hmm. German serves me. And most recently, uh, Learning from the Germans, Race and the Memory of Evil. 
She's also published uh, incredibly prolifically, more than 100 essays, and is the mother of three grown children. She writes in her official bio, so I'm going to say it because I mm -hmm. think mothers deserve Indeed. all the credit in the world. And she lives in Berlin in Germany, and that's where she's speaking to us from tonight. The title of her talk this afternoon is What I Learned After Writing, Learning from the Germans. And before um, I finally welcome her, I just want to briefly explain the format of this session. Uh, she, Dr. Nyman, see, I did it. Dr. Nyman, um, I do it. Between Answer the post, not to worry. <laughs> She will speak for around 40 minutes, after which she'll be happy to entertain questions from you, the audience, for about half an hour. Um, please write your questions in the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen on the webinar. I will select from them and read them aloud. And now please welcome, please join me in welcoming Dr. Susan Neiman. Thank you, Catherine, and uh, thank you for the invitation and for the introduction. Um, <clears throat> let's get going. I'm going to assume that few people listening have read my last book. So I want to start with a summary of what Germany has done right, from which I've argued Americans can learn. Before I go into um, what's basically, well, it's not a finished version, but it's the, the chapter I didn't get to write that I wish I could add to the book now because so very much has changed in both countries in the two years since the book was published. So the Germans have an idea called Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung. I think we can translate that as historical reckoning. Um, it, the German idea was historically unique and breathtaking. I think it's an ongoing process because it's something that takes generations of work. It literally means working off the past and it may never be finally finished, but it's moved Germany forward in ways that can clearly be perceived by anyone who, as I have observed the country very closely since 1982. So what was historically novel? Just this, people and nations much prefer to remember the heroic chapters of their past. Those are the narratives that we memorialize and repeat in monuments, story and song. Where the historic chapters are too few or too compromised, people and nations will offer a narrative of victimhood. In a sense, this is a way of hanging on to a frame of heroism. It's the belief, well, our people would have been heroes, but history turned them into victims. In the first decades after the war, West Germans too hung on to this dialectic, having told to be heroic in the language of the Nazis, um, <clears throat> the unconditional surrender left them feeling very much like the war's worst victims. For non-Germans, it's quite a shock to read the litanies. And they go something like this. We lost the war. Uh, a huge slice of our territory, our cities were in ashes. We lost 7 million people, military and civilian, with most of the soldiers who survived were uh, imprisoned in POW camps. We were hungry, just barely alive. And on top of it, all the damn Yankees Blame us for starting the war. Okay, the last two uh, claims I've worded in order to draw parallels with defenders of the lost cause. Germans didn't complain about stupid vulgar Yankees, but stupid vulgar armies, which was their slightly pejorative name for Americans. And I referenced a line from the beautiful and beautifully problematic elegy for the Confederacy called the night they drove old Dixie down. Well, unlike millions of Americans who still hold on to the lost cause narrative, Germany took a further step. It became the first nation in the world to shift its narrative out of the hero victim framework into a third category, that of the perpetrator. This was an incredibly difficult thing to do, and it was just as strongly resisted as many Americans today still resist dismantling the lost cause. The thousands of Germans, often unnamed and barely known, who worked in small grassroots groups, 
often literally digging up Gestapo torture chambers or untangling the vines that covered the ruins of concentration camps, those people should be honored. From the late 1950s to the early 1990s, such people worked often enduring lots of abuse from their fellow citizens. Um, you know, the nicest thing they called them were, you know, dirtying your own nest. That was one of the netzbeschmutze was a word that was used against those people who forced the Germans to acknowledge the crimes of the Nazis. Um, I know those crimes seem obvious to most anyone outside Germany, but Germans were still stuck in a narrative that emphasized their own wartime and post-war suffering, which in fact was considerable, even if um, we can rightly say they brought it on themselves. And the physical work of finding, restoring, and marking sites of terror was only the literal unburying. Historical reckoning is not only slow, but multifaceted, and it's taken place in Germany on many levels, building memorials to the victims, changing public culture to include an incredible number of books, films, and artworks, condemning the Nazi past, making sure the school curriculum prioritizes the Holocaust. My own three Jewish children often found that to be too much, I should say. Now the past year in Germany has seen a flood of print denouncing that work as incomplete or routinized to the point of leading to what's called Sündenstolz, pride in your own sins or a sense of moral superiority for having recognized and atoned for the sins of the past. Um, this is something that's often claimed I have never met it once. On the contrary, what I meet most often are Germans who say they would never read a book with the title Learning from the Germans, so sure are they that there's nothing to be learned. I sometimes reply this proves my point. No other country in the world is so fiercely resistant to any form of praise. And of course, the historical reckoning was incomplete. Um, how should we expect an entirely new concept to be completely realized on the first try? You don't get rid of prejudice in a generation or two. Um, but in order to realize this new concept more fully, I think it's still important to recognize the immensity of what's already been accomplished and achieved. Now, to appreciate that immensity, we need to think comparatively across space and time. The American reckoning with our national crimes has proceeded fast and furiously these past two or three years, but it's still in its infancy. I date it from President Obama's eulogy for the nine churchgoers in Charleston, which was the first time any national leader drew a connection between the violence of the present and our repression of the violence of the past. And if you can remember, it seems almost like another era, but if you can remember back <laughs> to 2015, the effect was powerful. For the first time, Republican governors took down Confederate flags. Walmart announced it would no longer sell Confederate memorabilia. But this was only six years ago, and I don't have to tell you that weddings are still held at plantations, otherwise known as concentration camps for Black people. Note, I didn't say death camps, but they were concentration camps, and of course, many people died. Um, and we also saw Confederate flags being waved at the unsuccessful coup on January 6th. So the progress that's been made in the past two years has been incredible. I once wrote that there were no Nazi memorials in Germany, and of course, um, somebody wrote to correct me, there are a couple of small memorials still standing, but they're small and out of the way. There's nothing comparable to the memorials to Confederate generals that uh, still dot the US, not only in the South, or the generic statues to Johnny Reb that stand in the square of most Southern towns. It's impossible to imagine a generic Hans Wehrmacht statue in Germany. Still, um, in the past two years, uh, we've seen memorials to Confederate soldiers come down, and we're even beginning to question whether Christopher Columbus, who murdered thousands of indigenous people, ought to be honored. Those who claim that the remaining memorials are a product of history, not hate, forget the obvious. 
we don't memorialize every part of our history. Instead, we choose men and occasionally women who lived lives that represent values we want our children to honor and our communities to share. Mitch Landro, the former mayor of New Orleans, made a moving speech when he ordered four statues of Confederate heroes to be dismantled. He said he didn't want a little black girl walking by a statue of Robert E. Lee, who was not there to accept or encourage her. <clears throat> I agree with that, but I also don't want a little white boy walking by that statue either, thinking that Lee's life exemplified a model of masculine honor to which he should aspire. So it's with relief and some surprise that I've watched monuments come down in the United States, though, thanks to COVID, I've been watching from a distance. Outside America, the historical reckoning is even slower. I won't bother to talk about Austria, whose aversion to it is notorious. Austrians prefer to think of their nation as Hitler's first victim. The former great colonial powers are just beginning to examine their own crimes. A Guardian poll of last year showed that only 19% of Britons see any reason for remorse or shame regarding their former empire. <coughs> France, Holland, and Belgium have only begun very sporadically to pay attention to theirs. And Spain, whose empire was probably the most murderous, hasn't even started. Now there's a large informal group of Germans who call themselves anti-Deutsch, who among other things, uh, protest that Germany never faced its colonial crimes, partly because of those protests, but also partly because it already had this concept of Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung, historical reckoning. Germany has moved faster and farther to face its colonial history than any other European uh, former colonial power. And it's done so at the highest levels of state just last month in a very moving speech by the president at the opening of Germany's largest museum. So across space, Germany has done better than its critics allege. This is also true across time. Many of the critics aren't old enough to remember what Germany was like in the 80s, much less earlier, and can't see the progress that's been made. But there are real flaws in the process, and I believe they begin with one flaw so grave that we have to address it before further progress can be made. I should add, not too many people here agree with me. I've gotten hate mail for these series of of claims. They're all utterly researched, fact-checked by two German historians and um, many, many other people. But um, what you're about to hear is not an orthodox view. German memory culture, as it's sometimes called, applies only to West Germany. East Germans remember the post-war historical reckoning completely differently than do West Germans. And if West Germans know that at all, it's only to spit out the words verordnete antifascismus, that is fascism ordered from above. Now, I discussed East German anti-fascism in a long chapter of my book, for anyone who's interested in learning more, because I've never understood the accusation, wasn't it right? that a people who spent 12 years slurping up fascist propaganda should have anti-fascism ordered by the government from abroad, from above. And decent West Germans criticized the Adenauer era, that is the, the first 20 years after the war, precisely because it did not promote anti-fascism. Uh, just a reign of silence, which allowed former Nazis to return to powerful and prominent positions, as long as they let off one pillar of anti, of one pillar of Nazism, that is anti-Semitism, while loudly proclaiming the other. And the other pillar of Nazism was what a German historian, Willy Winkler, has called verordnete anti-communismus, that is anti-communism ordered from above. If we want to open a can of worms, we can talk about the difference between American and German anti-communism. There are interesting differences, but in both places they're intense. Now, 
Uh, I know that East Germany's anti-fascism was abused, as state ideologies usual, usually are, in order to obscure its own forms of tyranny. I've dealt with these and other objections in my book, so I won't take time to argue them here. But for anyone tempted to respond by pointing out what were very real flaws of uh, East Germany, I would summarize like this. Until 1985, there was only one German state that would have agreed to the proposition the Nazis were criminals and their defeat was a liberation. And that state was East Germany, not West Germany. But there's another reason for remembering East German anti-fascism that's important for contemporary debates and not just a matter of historical justice. East Germany's understanding of fascism was not Judeo-centric, just in case it isn't obvious, I'm Jewish, but I belong to the universalist tradition of Judaism. Uh, found in the book of Exodus and then uh, the prophets and then many, many other places in uh, Jewish literature, but it is not the only tradition. So East Germany not only commemorated the deaths of 6 million Jews, but of 27 million other peoples, uh, civilian and military, who were murdered in the Soviet Union. It also paid attention to the crimes of colonialism. In other words, although East German reckoning with Nazi history had so many flaws of its own that I wouldn't recommending, recommend taking it up wholesale, it also had elements that are missing in the historical reckoning of what's now the Federal Republic of Germany. Uh, East Germany did not reduce all Nazi crimes to anti-Semitism, but it treated anti-Semitism as a particularly virulent form of racism. As a universalist Jew, I don't find this offensive, much less anti-Semitic. After all, we now know that Nazi uh, legal scholars used American race laws as their template when they were writing the Nuremberg laws. With one caveat, they thought American anti-Black legislation was too harsh to be used in Germany. This is a detailed finding of a book called Hitler's American Model by a Yale law professor, James Whitman. I urge you to read it. It is short, but shocking. Now, the Federal Republic, that is Germany today, has uh, reduced Nazism to anti-Semitism. And it's led to a host of problems that would be funny if they weren't dangerous and potentially tragic. You might think it's funny that Germans now regularly accuse Jews of being anti-Semitic. If they're universalists who don't accept all of the policies of the state of Israel, and insist also on calling attention to injustice towards Palestinians. It isn't funny if some of those Jews, many Israeli, some families of Holocaust survivors lose jobs or opportunities to speak, show their art or play their music in publicly funded spaces. Now, despite my German critics who are far more numerous than um, my American ones, I stand by most of what I wrote when I handed in the manuscript of learning from the Germans in November 2018. American publishers are slow, so it takes about a year from manuscript to book. But as I said at the beginning, I wish I could add another chapter because developments in the past two years in both countries has added another important layer that deeply troubles me. Uh, here I'm reminded of my late friend, Tony Judd's frequent quoting of John Maynard Keynes, who said, when the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do, sir? I've come to find the two rather ominous developments very similar, and I think they stem from similar causes. But I'm going to start with two anecdotes, which are not quite one month old. The first of which should ring bells with many of you, because I'm betting you could tell your own stories. 
I attended about a month ago an American conference, assuming that virtual attendance counts as attendance, honoring the work of a philosopher I knew well. Now, philosophers are trained to criticize the work of other philosophers. It's sometimes claimed that one reason there are few women in the field is that philosophy is a combat sport. I think it's gotten more civilized since I was in graduate school when people were regularly encouraged to develop knockdown arguments and uh, you praised one talk by saying he wiped the floor with the other guy. But still, even if it's gotten somewhat less violent, um, critically examining other philosophers' arguments is fundamental to doing philosopher, philosophy. The philosopher whose work was being honored at the conference was white, and his work had been sharply and multiply criticized as racist by a black philosopher. My talk was meant to honor the white philosopher by examining the arguments of the black philosopher and showing that the charge of racism was false. Uh, my talk went over like a lead balloon. There were no comments. And I regretted the fact that I'd taken the time it took to write it. And I turned my attention to other things until I got an email the next day from a philosopher I'd never met. He praised my talk and said he'd thought about doing something similar but he'd been warned by other colleagues not to do so because criticizing the black philosopher would leave him open to charges of racism himself. And he praised what he called my courage for saying things that no one else would. I don't think I was being courageous. I just didn't get the message, I guess. Um, I thought this person was an anomaly until I got a few other emails from others who'd been at the conference, as well as people who hadn't but had heard of my talk and wanted copies of it. In fact, their criticisms of the Black philosopher were considerably stronger and more sharply worded than mine had been, but apparently no one made them public. Now, this was a more or less public conference, so I feel at liberty to give enough details so that if there are any philosophers in the audience, um, they may be able to guess the philosophers involved, um, though not the emails which were private. What's much more disturbing is what takes place in private. And the second anecdote happened just a couple of weeks ago in Berlin. Like every member of every committee that ever meets to award prizes or jobs or funding, I am bound to secrecy about what takes place during those discussions. There are good reasons for such discretion, um, as you, the academics of, among you know, or other people who serve on committees. Um, and I'll try to preserve it by disguising even um, more of what happened. Um, again, there, I serve on enough committees, so it should be hard to guess which one this was. But our commitments to keeping deliberation secret allow for abuses that can never be proven because we've all promised to reveal uh, nothing that happened in committee. This particular committee is based in Berlin with international members. The previous week we'd met by Zoom to award a job or a grant or a prize to a distinguished researcher. The person who was chosen was not my first choice, so I had no skin in the game that followed. I preferred someone else, but the deliberations were democratic and fair. The field wasn't a specialty of mine, and I had no qualms about deferring to the majority. I didn't know any of the candidates personally. A few days after the decision, the members of the committee received an email from the administrator asking if we could meet that day on an urgent matter. Internet research, which the administrator described as due diligence, had turned up an accusation that the person we'd selected was anti-Semitic, and a link to the accusation was provided. When I told the story to a friend who's a professor of journalism at Columbia, he laughed incredulously. He said, they think due diligence means Googling around? <laughs> um, the answer is yes, they do. And they uh, don't think you need to verify or check the quality of the sources. Now, because of the ways in which the charge of anti-Semitism has been abused in the past uh, two years in Berlin, including forcing the resignation of the director of the Jewish Museum of Berlin, 
Um, I've spent a lot of my time embroiled in a controversy that's played out uh, intensely in the German media. And so I was prepared. The link turned out to be an eight-year-old post from a third-rate blogger. Anyone who's followed the ways in which the Israeli-Palestinian conflict plays out in the media could tell from the way the post was written that it was tendentious and highly partisan, the sort of thing that might be supported by, yes, a quick click on the link from which the blog had been reposted showed that it was in an organization financed by Sheldon Adelson. While only a handful of Germans had ever heard of Sheldon Adelson, and none of them were on this committee. In fact, as I had learned to my surprise earlier this year, most Germans have never heard of Haaretz. Um, so my attempt to contrast the claims made by a third-rate blogger and those made by the editor-in-chief of Haaretz um, was pointless. Um, there were three Jews on this committee, two of us Israeli citizens. I moved to Israel shortly after the Oslo Agreement and taught at Tel Aviv University for five years. One of them said nothing throughout the emergency meeting, so I have no idea what he thought. Two of us, two Israeli citizens, vehemently protested uh, the proposal that the candidate be denied the job or the prize or the grant. Uh, because of an unverified rumor from a highly problematic source. My Israeli colleague, who I know to be unflappable, or um, at least a less outspoken person than I am, used the word witch hunt. The editor-in-chief of Haaretz had used the word McCarthyite. The Germans were unmoved, determined to fight every possible appearance of anti-Semitism or every provocate any uh, criticism of the state of Israel, they railroaded the committee to immediately withdraw the job or the price of the grant. After all, they said there were two other good candidates on the short list. And of course, there are always more good candidates than there are jobs or prizes or grants. Why not give it to someone who wouldn't cause trouble? After all, said one person in a hilarious misuse of Karl Popper's ideas about falsification, this particular accusation of anti-Semitism might turn out to be false or distorted, but who knew if another one might eventually turn up? Uh, so in order to protect Jews and Israelis, who in this case actually knew something about the issues involved, our voices were overridden and the candidate had been chosen uh, disqualified. I've known that this sort of thing has been happening in Germany for the past year and a half, but um, I had never been a part of one. Um, I've been working with a group which has called, uh, called out this sort of soft censorship in general, but we've always been accused of not presenting evidence. Well, of course we can't present evidence um, since everybody involved is sworn to secrecy. Um, one colleague who was at this meeting uh, told me she was inclined to resign from the committee in protest, but she hesitated because she suspected her self-interested motive. Uh, she'd love to have a reason to get off another damn committee. <laughs> who wouldn't? She's an extremely moral person. Um, I was leaning towards quitting the committee, but didn't do so until we were asked to sign off on minutes that were so false, they reminded me of Stalin's attempt to write Trotsky out of Russian history. But even though I have resigned now, I cannot make this story entirely public without violating the commitment to discretion, which I made when agreeing to join. And so this kind of thing goes on. I think these two stories, which are by no means unique, just meant to be representative, stem from a common source. In the last few years, Americans and Germans have become more aware of the depth and persistence of racism and anti-Semitism. I don't need to tell you what happened in America to raise white people's awareness of white supremacy. Uh, call it a certain political party that showed its cards at the very latest at the violent demonstration in Charlottesville in 2018, which is now finally on trial. 
And just a little earlier in late 2017 in Germany, for the first time since the war, a far right party opposed both to immigration and to Germany's historical reckoning was elected to parliament for the first time. Quite rightly, decent Germans were disturbed, though even in the first election, their numbers were much smaller than those of similar parties in other European countries, not to mention in America, and their numbers went down to 11% in our most recent election in September. That's still too high, even if I wish that only 11% of American voters supported the failed fascist from Queens. But the flurry of reaction by the German government has been deeply flawed. The first reaction was to appoint a federal commissioner for the prevention of anti-Semitism and every state but one has in addition appointed its own at the state level. None of these people has a deep knowledge of Jews or Israel. The federal commissioner was caught marching with a group of those Christian evangelical Zionists who want to start a war in the occupied territories so their Messiah will come and convert the rest of us or send us to hell if we don't convert. Um, but the commissioner saw an Israeli flag, so he marched along. Um, the role of Christian Zionism is barely known in Germany, despite um, several efforts to enlighten people on the subject. Um, it strikes them as too crazy to be believed. <laughs> I get that. Um, a world Jewish conspiracy seems a more plausible uh, explanation. Um, Anti-Semitism commissioners who are so little versed in basic information are liable to accuse Jews of supporting anti-Semitism should we criticize any Israeli policies. And this has been happening uh, for two years. The Palestinian community in Germany is the largest in Europe and things are much worse for them. Last week, a young Palestinian German journalist lost her job as the moderator of a science show because an internet search showed she had liked a tweet by the organization Jewish Voices for Peace. Now, former Israeli ambassador to Germany, Avi Primor, who was earlier the vice president of Tel Aviv University, and Moshe Zimmerman, a distinguished Israeli historian of Germany and anti-Semitism, wrote a letter refuting every charge of anti-Semitism that had been made against her. But once again, the credibility of the sources didn't matter. The television station took the word of a right-wing tabloid more seriously than that of the distinguished and knowledgeable men who argued that the positions held by the journalists were frequently voiced in Israel where no one would lose a job over them. Now, one problem in Germany could be solved with the tools of enlightenment. Germans don't know enough about Jews, but not in the way that people in say Mozambique or Peru don't know about Jews. A deep sense of guilt leads Germans to focus on the one thing they do know about Jews, namely we horribly murdered them. This leads them to view Jews as monolithic victims. Now, most white Americans know more about black culture and simply know more black people than Germans know about Jews, but we know that our schools and our social lives are still pretty segregated. And this can lead many white people to view African Americans as if they all spoke with one voice just as most Germans are surprised to hear that there is no one Jewish voice uh, eternally focused on uh, the tragedies of anti-Semitism. And I believe on both sides of the Atlantic, we need to proceed with real caution. But I also think we're faced with a structural problem in both cases. Grassroots groups rightly insist that countries face up to their racist pasts, whose unexamined roots ensure that racist policies persist to this day. What we want when we do this as activists is to change national consciousness. 
And when we're largely successful, as such groups have been, it took a good 50 years or so, um, but such groups were successful in Germany. We want a change in national consciousness to lead to changes in government policy. The problem is that government policies are government policies. <laughs> They're not sensitive to new ones, and they run the danger of making decisions based, if not exactly on algorithms, then on other kinds of formulas that easily become ossified and automatic. And this is, in fact, what happened to the state doctrine of anti-fascism in East Germany. The best I can do for an American analogy is to ask you to imagine um, the following example. Suppose the Biden administration decided to initiate a federal office for combating white supremacy and appointed Robin DiAngelo to head it. Um, this is an imaginative stretch, I realize, because they'd appoint a person of color, but then there are far more people of color in America than there are Jews in Germany. So just stay with me for a moment anyway. Then imagine that Robin DiAngelo began to go after John McWhorter. If you don't know this very acute and courageous black professor of linguistics at Columbia, uh, he's recently been given uh, a column at the New York Times, which I highly recommend, as well as his new book called Woke Racism. Now, in my thought experiment, D'Angelo, who McWhorter has sharply criticized, wouldn't quite call him a racist personally, though she would if he were white, but she'd accuse him of giving aid and comfort to racists. And this is roughly what's been happening in Germany. In the admirable, reasonable interest of combating anti-Semitism, well-meaning Germans, mostly well-meaning, are attacking Jews who question whether every perceived charge of anti-Semitism is genuine, by saying that we are giving aid and comfort to the right wing, or even calling us anti-Semitic ourselves. So I want to conclude by saying there are lots of things we can learn from the Germans. And the one that concerns me in this moment is whether we can learn from its hysterical reactions to genuine problems. And I'm going to quote you. Um, something McWhorter wrote in yesterday's New York Times in response to the Virginia election. McWhorter urges Democrats who are appalled by the hysteria over CRT, critical race theory, to face facts. No elementary school students are not learning legal theory. And yes, the phrase CRT was indeed popularized by a Republican who said he took the three most triggering words for the voters he wants to mobilize, critical race and theory. It's depressing that those are words that could drive people mad, um, but there was an interesting New Yorker article a couple months ago about it. But McWhorter argues what he calls CRT light is indeed a part of education, media, and publishing uh, a remarkable development in less than two years. So here's a summary of CRT light that he quotes. CRT is not just talking about historical and contemporary racism with a view to overcoming it, but a set of core beliefs that racism is ordinary and or permanent, that white supremacy is everywhere, that white people don't oppose racism unless it suits them, that there is a unique voice of color that just so happens to be the one that agrees with CRT and much more. End quote. Here's a fact about me that makes Germans laugh. In 1982, on my way to Berlin for what I thought was going to be a year on a Fulbright Fellowship, I thought the best way to prepare was to read a lot of Goethe. I even memorized the beginning. Ah, Catherine's laughing too. I even uh, I memorized uh, quite long bits of the uh, beginning of Faust. Now, landed in uh, Berlin, everybody reacted the way Catherine did. Uh, the people that I met, all decent anti Nazi intellectuals and artists, 
thought that this was not just old fashioned, it was completely wrong. In their view at the time, uh, all of German culture was contaminated because it led up to the Nazis. At most, it was okay to read Brecht because he had to flee to America, but everything else was just taboo. Now, in the intervening years, um, Goethe has been rehabilitated, um, though some now people, some people are going after Kant. I won't get into that. Um, in many places in the US, however, the commitment to dealing with the racism and violence in our history has become the view that American history is only a history of racism and violence. There's nothing in it to be honored or celebrated. And this is a very dangerous view, not only because it could cost us more than the election in Virginia. Even ignoring worries about backlash, which I don't, um, we cannot have thriving, healthy citizens if their view of history, of their history, is irredeemably bleak. Um, to quote McWhorter again, the horror of slavery, the hypocrisy of Jim Crow, the terror of lynching, the devastating loss of life and property in Tulsa and other massacres, no student should get through roughly middle school ignorant of these things. And anyone who thinks that is politics needs to join the rest of us in the 21st century, end quote. I agree. And it's good to know that these claims, which sounded quite radical when I was writing Learning from the Germans, are now taken as self-evident in the New York Times. Facing the most shameful parts of American history have, at least among most educated Americans, become part of a citizen's task in ways we could not have imagined a few years ago. But this confrontation with our history must be done carefully with nuance and courage, neither of which are in great supply among any people beginning to acknowledge their own nation's crimes. Still, nuance and courage are virtues that can be practiced and learned. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, this was quite a bracing talk. And um, the reason I was laughing wasn't laughing at your decision to read Goethe in 1982, but rather because I sympathize and I probably would do the same, would have done or would still do the same thing. I'm very much believe in immersion in culture and tradition in order to understand the present, even if culture and tradition uh, stand in opposition to or have to be reinterpreted. So I was just laughing with empathy, um, certainly not, not at you. Uh, from well, I, think that I got laughed at so much for this that, you know, I can now <laughs> tell the story and laugh myself. <laughs> um, it's, at the it's, time, it was very disconcerting, I have to it's say. A, it's a wonderful story, um, and I can see why it would be disconcerting. So um, we have a number of um, questions and um, um, statements by people, and I think I'm just going to um, proceed through them in order. Uh, many people are saying thank you, thank you. Um, and I honestly, uh, Chrissy, you can manage the chat maybe because I'm looking at the q and I can't, I'm very not, very much not a multitasking uh, person. So um, Mario Kessler writes, a voice from Berlin, Germany, before any question, my overall judgment not only mine, learning from the Germans is a landmark in the history of memory culture. Susan, he would say Nyman, brings together cultures of remembrance that are separated from one another, of Americans and Germans, of East and West Germans, of Jews and non-Jews, of Black and white Americans. The book makes clear that the respective reappraisals of the past can be thought together so much for a general appraisal. The book obviously invites controversial debate as well. And that's another advantage. Um, would you like to respond? Oh, I just have to say thank you, Mario. Um, um, uh, uh, Mario wrote the um, 
the best and most extensive review of the book in um, German, and um, it's going to be published in uh, Jacobin uh, soon. So I appreciate the, um, I, I pre that was a plug. I appreciate the plug. Um, Great. <laughs> but I do um, wish I could add another chapter and I may have to instead write a short book, depend, you know, a very short book. <laughs> I'll see. Wonderful. Uh, Victoria Burns writes, as a Jewish American in Berlin, I agree that Germany has, quote, reckoned with its past, end quote, in a way that the United States has not. With that being said, what do you make of the many statues, memorials, and honorary cemeteries dedicated to the uh, Wehrmacht soldiers, more, most sponsored by the Volksbund Deutsche Kriegsfürsorge, um, and pardon my German, it has a Yiddish accent, or of the Volkstrauertag, where the German federal president honors the, vict the quote, victims of both world wars, end quote, before honoring the victims of anti-Semitism in Germany. Can there be a connection made between the memorialization of Confederate soldiers in the US, American South, and the continued memorialization, memorialization of Wehrmacht soldiers in Germany, particularly in West Germany? Can you discuss the difference, if there is one, between the German Wehrmacht soldier and a Nazi soldier, between a Confederate soldier and a Southern soldier? That's yeah. a lot of questions. <laughs> A lot of questions, but there's a huge difference. There was a draft on. Um, and so some 19 million men were uh, involved in the Wehrmacht and only a small percentage of them were members of the Nazi party. The only way to get out of the Wehrmacht was by doing something worse, like working in a concentration camp, okay? Um, you know, so that's, that's a fairly crucial difference, it seems to me. And if a family chooses to remember, um, you know, I mean, I, I, I know people, I had friends whose, you know, brothers or families were absolute anti-Nazis and were still sent off to the front and who still fell there. Um, and um, that they want to express their grief um, you know, it depends on how it's, how it's done, of course, but if they want to express their grief that their brother or their son or their husband or their father fell and even fell in a war that they didn't want, um, that seems perfectly all right to me. Um, folks, Talatag is a different question. That was... Um, that comes from the Adenauer era. That was a sort of helpless way of trying to um, deal with the fact that indeed at the time, the nation, the West German part of the nation really did consider itself to be um, a nation of victims. And I, you know, I, I, I actually don't know where it's observed and taken seriously. It's certainly not discussed. I mean, what's discussed in the media is the 9th of November, um, say, um, you know, and I have never seen the folks Tawatak being actually observed or taken seriously, but I could be wrong about this. I don't read everything. Um, I'd, I'd be up for, uh, I'd be up for, doing away with it, however. Um, you know, I I guess I even, it's funny, I, I have a friend whose older brother, brother he never met because he was born after the war. Um, all three of his brothers uh, were killed on the front. And this man himself, um, you know, has been one of the most, um, you know, passionate, engaged people to, you know, work towards understanding and uncovering and facing the Nazi past. He was the creator of the Wehrmacht exhibit, um, which did finally show that although, and this goes back to the first question, um, millions of people were drafted into the Wehrmacht who did not, who were not Nazis, 
um, but the Wehrmacht itself systematically committed war crimes, okay? So this is a person who's been behind that. And nevertheless, um, he uh, went, he made some effort to discover the grave of the fallen half brother who he had never met, who was 19 years old and was shot in the Ukraine and to bring the bones back to Germany, to the family plot. And I, I can understand that. I don't see anything wrong with that. Um, Victoria Burns remarks that the Volks, Volkstrauertag is every November celebrated in Berlin. It was last in November, 2020. Um, yeah, I know that it is. The question yeah. is to what degree is it to what degree is it celebrated? How and what you know, we have we have a whole series of um I, I mean starting with January 27th and the liberation of Auschwitz. And um, you know, there's a series of commemorations that are taken very seriously. I, I would have to stop and think a second to count all of them because there are so many. We just had November 9th, which is complicated for the Germans because November 9th had also, um, it's been called the fateful day of German history because other things happened there too. Um, so the things that get attention in the media, I know it's folks talk, I think coming up this Sunday or something, but I, the only reason I know that is that it's written in my calendar. I wouldn't know it because <laughs> there was, uh, you know, a ceremony or because it played a big role in the national media. I, I know what it is, but, um, and something about how it developed, but it doesn't have any of the weight, at least in this part of the country. And I suspect in most others that these other commemorations of uh, Nazi crimes or, um, you know, the end of the war do. Okay. Oliver Bach ans asks or states, um, thank you for this great and interesting talk. Have you considered what is now called uh, Zundenstolz, perhaps has its roots in the long history of German Christian mentality, especially German Protestantism, during the era of Baroque literature in the 17th century, developed a strong mentality of being guilty as a condition of being saved. Soon, however, this mentality changed from being an ethos to being a mere ritual. All this, and this seems to be the same, is what critics of Zundenstolz address now, that German um, memory culture, Erinnung, Kultur. Yeah, thanks for the German lesson. Uh, perhaps is often insincere, insincere and not wholehearted. So that is a good point to you know point back to a certain Protestant um, you know tradition. But you see, I hear a lot of critics of Zundenstolz. I have never met anyone who exemplifies this thing that has been criticized. On the contrary, I meet anti-Deutsche. I meet people who are furious at me for suggesting that the German, that, that Germany is ahead of other nations in facing up to its sins. Um, if somebody would show me, so I, I mean, I really do feel like this is a straw person. Um, the, you know, attack on Zundenstolz, show me somebody who's, you know, exemplifies it and I'll revise my views. But I, I, what I run into is always the opposite. And, you know, all the people who do Erinnerungskultur, um, all the people who comment on it, um, comment on the, uh, make, raise exactly the points that you're raising. It's too ritualistic. It hasn't gone far enough. We have the AFD, look at, you know, um, you know, look at all the problems that we still have. And my point is simply, I see them and I see them in all kinds of ways. And I've certainly experienced anti-Semitism, but I also have to say, I experienced anti-Semitism uh, in the South and I've also experienced it in the UK. So, you know, anti-Semitism is pretty 
constant across most nations. Um, and, uh, you know, the expectation that this process Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung is like waving a magic wand and suddenly the racism goes away seems to me to be a silly expectation about how human beings and how societies work. Um, so anyway, it's, it's a nice point about um, Sonnenstolz and Luther and um, you know other Christian uh, theologians, but I just uh, I need to be shown somebody who actually says where well, there's another thing people will talk about Weltmeister. Is in Weltmeister der Erinnerungskultur. Um, but that's, again, a charge that's made, and I have never met anyone who remotely talks like that. Jonathan Sperber uh, comments, you describe the anti-fascism of the former German Democratic Republic, devoted above all to atonement for the Nazis' attack on the USSR. One of the most striking results of this attitude has been the strong sympathy in those parts of the reunited Germany that were once part of the GDR um, for the government and policies of Vladimir Putin, including his invasion of the Ukraine, his suppression, suppression of dissent and murder of dissenters. Do these attitudes suggest that the communist regime's efforts to repudiate the Nazi past contained within it distinctly problematic elements. It contained many problematic elements, although that's not the one that I would refer to. Look, um, support for Putin, I would say, is, um, is pretty exaggerated, whether it's East or West. At the, uh, after the invasion of Crimea, there was a sort of um, derogatory word. He's a Russland versteher. He's somebody who tries to understand Russia. I don't think there's anything wrong with trying to understand Russia. I can despise Vladimir Putin, which I do, um, while also saying Russia has security concerns that NATO um, and West Germany completely ignored. And, you know, as a country that was, uh, you know, nearly wiped out twice, um, you know, it's, uh, I, again, this is not to defend the invasion of the Crimea. I don't defend it, okay? But, I think it's worth understanding Russian history uh, as much as possible in Russian terms. And of course, that was something that was indeed um, cultivated more in the GDR than uh, in West Germany or in the United States, where, you know, you, I mean, in the US and the UK, um, you know, it's very, very common for people to think that the Second World War was won at Normandy and to absolutely forget that, no, it was without the Red Army, um, you know, the Nazis would have won, okay? And we have such a... Um, I wouldn't even say a hostile perspective. I mean, first of all, you know, the equation of Russia, Putin and communism and the Soviet Union, that's a completely ridiculous equation, very different people, very different uh, states. But our, our information is sorely lacking. So that's the first thing. And I, I, I don't see that, um, I just don't see, I see more understanding of Russia. Some people still learned Russian in school, but I am not seeing evidence of, you know, enthusiasm for Putin. Um, you know, yeah, there are a couple of, you know, there's been small pockets, but I don't think that's the case. I think there are 
other problems of um, GDR anti-fascism. It was instrumentalized to uh, support repression in the GDR most stupidly and famously. Uh, the wall was called the anti-fascist protection wall, which of course was, you know, the, the sort of stupidest and most glaring form of instrumentalization. And so as time went on in the GDR, what had really been a genuine commitment to fighting fascism, and of course the leaders, both political and cultural of the GDR, had been people who uh, fought for the Republicans in the Spanish Civil War, or um, you know, were in concentration camps, or had had to flee the country. So it was very committed, um, and it became over time ritualistic and hard to take seriously. Although I must say that every single East German I ever spoke to, and I spoke to an awful lot of people who were dissidents, and I asked them how genuine was the anti-fascism, and there's a whole long chapter in my book about this. Um, um, God, I get distracted if I look at the chat. Anyway, um, uh, these are people who said to me, you know, I could criticize everything else about the GDR, but that point was genuine, okay? Um, but of course it got less so with time and routine and ritualizations. And what I am afraid of is, is of something similar happening in the US um, with regard to anti-racism. And I'm quite uneasy about some of the struggles that I mentioned um, that are happening right now in Germany. Um, Victoria Burns has a really good question. Based on one of your stories about your experience on a committee in Berlin that you just told us so stirringly, um, how do you, uh, do you feel that your voice as a Jewish person has been or is stifled or disregarded by non-Jewish -Jew Germans in their attempt to not appear anti-Semitic? It seems that although Germans don't know very much about Jews, they try to act based on, quote, the best interest of Jews, end quote, but often disregard real Jewish voices in their pursuit of historical reckoning. This is absolutely true. It's one of the things that, you know, makes me angriest. Um, the situation is a little bit well, it's different in many ways, of course, in the situation in, in uh, the United States. There is an official Jewish community here. You may choose to join the official community. Um, then you tithe 1% of, uh, of your income and you are counted. More than half of all the Jews in Germany choose not to belong to the Gemeinde. I don't belong to it. Um, the 40,000 Israelis who are here certainly don't belong to it, but many of us um, do not belong to it because it's quite a, uh, well, I would call it reactionary rather than conservative. Um, it's quite a reactionary organization. It's not, um, uh, you know, it's just not a place that I, I would, care to have represent me. The problem is because I have uh, been talking to many people, including politicians, about exactly this problem, because I'm not the only progressive Jew who is not being listened to in some of these debates. I spoke to all of the three center left parties at different occasions in the course of this year. And I basically said the same thing. I said, hey, um, Jews are just like other people. There are prog progressive Jews and right-wing Jews and the progressive parties should be speaking to the progressive Jews. And uh, the head of one of these parties said to me, I do know that. The problem is you don't have a telephone number and the official community has a telephone number. I mean, and she didn't just mean that. I, I, no, it's a, it's a deeper point. It's, it's a kind of Henry Kissinger point before the European Union, you know? It's, 
Um, there's an organization. It does very hard lobbying. It's very, very close to the Israeli government. I mean, in lockstep. And that's the representative of the Jewish voice in Germany. But the um, over half of us, well, some of the over half of us who are not representing, represented by the Gemeinde are, are working on establishing some kind of an official organization so that, I mean, there are a couple of small, there's an organization called YID um, in Leipzig, I forget what it stands for, but it's, you know, progressive Jews in Germany. Um, there are little pockets of people. Um, there isn't the kind of organization and money, frankly, um, that the official community has, and it's a work, uh, some of us are working on it. Going to take a while, but by next year, I hope things will be moving. Dan Nathans asks, are, if you're familiar with Dirk Moses's essay, The German Catechism, and the controversy it's aroused, would you care to comment? Is Dirk Moses's corrective to reflexive German anti-anti-Semitism something you think should flourish? I have been talking about Dirk Moses this year so much, and to Dirk Moses, by the way. Um, and he um, he gave a quite sane version of his uh, argument uh, at a conference that I held last month. Yes, I'm very familiar with it. And it has various iterations. In its original iteration, um, I didn't agree. Originally, for those of you who don't know this controversy, he argues that um, sort of the German general public has to agree to a catechism. The Holocaust was singular. I forget all the five points of the catechism, um, but, um, you know, it's this very Judeo-centered picture of fascism and of what needs to be done in order basically to root out the fascist in, in me. I mean, Germans really are concerned and I get it that their parents or grandparents have left them with, I realize this sounds primitive and nobody would quite express it this way, but I've met people who do, bad blood. The bad blood. So how do you get out of the bad blood and the heritage of Nazism and Dirk Moses stated a catechism? Um, I don't think he's wrong that there's a set of, uh, you know, sort of official pronouncements that um, people feel bound to repeat in any situation where I thought he was very wrong was in suggesting in some of his earlier statements that um, Germans uphold the catechism in order to repress their history of colonial violence and other racist violence. And that's just simply wrong, okay? It just historically, um, uh, it's, I, it's not even oversimplified. It's just not went ha what happened and not what motivated the whole German process of Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung. He's since, in the course of a lot of discussions, revised that. And the other thing that I would say to him and to some of the people um, who have supported him in this debate, and I said it very briefly in, um, in my talk, um, Germany's actually ahead of the other former uh, colonial nations, precisely because it first did some reckoning with anti-Semitism uh, and with its not Nazi history. So it had a concept already. And when an international discussion of colonialism began for the first time really in very many years, um, as an international process, um, largely pushed on by Black Lives Matter, Germany was ready for it. I, again, I don't see, think that they've done everything right, but um, they are dealing uh, with, they are beginning to deal with the colonial history. So, uh, you know, my view on Dirk Moses is some of what he said is right, and um, 
perhaps it was good to get a debate going. He himself has told me, well, if I hadn't been so polemical, nobody else would be talking about it. That may, by the way, be true. You know, um, it's often the case that more nuanced discussions don't get the same kind of attention, but that's unfortunate. So there's um, a number more questions and about 10 minutes left. So yeah, I think good. what I'll do is actually read out the questions and you can then respond as you like, if you don't mind. Um, well, so, I'll try, yeah. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll, I mean, I'll you or you, you may, there, there aren't that many more questions. They're just about three or four. So uh, Daniel Siegel asks, um, what about the reparations given by the Germans to survivors? Was that not part of the critical, a critical part of the reckoning? Does it suggest that reparations are appropriate in perhaps the American context? Um, Kathleen Wright asks, does Germany's commitment to Vergangenheit Heights auf bei auf <laughs> auf art bei <laughs> sorry auf er beitung uh, play any role in Germany's stance towards China towards China's censorship of this cultural revolution and the massacre at Tiananmen Square and toward what is presently occurring to the Uyghurs um, in the West Marion Kant asks. A whole generation of young West Germans fled their country after World War II. They fled to America where they were, quote, free, unquote, from the oppressive German past and presence and did not have to live with a constant confrontation with their parents who were the living Nazi past and responsible for the Holocaust. Germans in the US could discuss anti-fascism or its absence, but did they think about American racism? How do you assess this dynamic of Germans leaving Germany and fighting, finding the freedom to talk about one aspect of their own history, but ignoring the more troubled aspect of the histories of their adopted country? Were they just as blind or self-centered as their Nazi parents? Uh, let me take the last one first. It's a good question. Um, but first of all, um, you know, by no means did all Germans in many generations uh, ignore those aspects. As a matter of fact, um, beginning or, you know, perhaps most prominently with Albert Einstein, but also um, many emigrants to the United States got very involved in the early civil rights movement. Okay. Um, the, the minute Einstein landed, he was, um, you know, defending and be and befriending the most radical voices in the early Black civil rights movement, W. B. Du Bois and uh, Paul Robeson. And while not everybody was as prominent as that, there certainly was a tradition of um, you know German emigres. Uh, speaking up against McCarthyism. I mean, a number of people, of course, went back after McCarthyism got serious or went back to, um, to East Germany in particular under McCarthyism. Brecht did, a lot of people did. Um, but, you know, the question is, is um, I think the questioner is concerned about the next generation. And honestly, uh, I was going to say you'd have to ask a historian because I don't know. Um, I certainly know Germans who were happy to get away from Germany and their Nazi parents and hoped they could find something like peaceful, healthy life. Um, you know, I frankly, I'll, 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 I'll actually. I'll go out on a limb here because I don't have anything like a historical overview of how many people did and how many people didn't notice what was going on in their adoptive country. I certainly know that, you know, the generation of immigrants did and they recognized it and they were often, often quite active. Um, I can remember myself sort of interesting, you, you can admit embarrassing things um, to total strangers <laughs> over Zoom. Um, 
but I can remember um, a German of that generation who um, I met when I was at Harvard and who made a political criticism of uh, something that was going on in the United States. And I think I said something like, you know, Germans are one to talk or something. Like I, I, there's, there's so much, it's less the case now, um, Angela Merkel, although we don't like her nearly as much in Germany as people like her in America, I think Angela Merkel has actually played a role in changing American um, views of, of Germans. But there's such an identification for such a long time of German and Nazi that I, I would suspect that if Germans, let's say of my generation, so not the war generation, but the generation after, um, if they were quiet about American crimes, it was because it was less because they were ignoring them than that they felt if they mentioned them, they would be criticized or that they didn't have the right to speak up. But this is just sheer speculation. I don't have a historical overview. We have oh, China. 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 Yeah. China. Look, <laughs> is anybody doing anything about the Uyghurs? Seriously? Um, I mean, I wish, I wish somebody would. Um, the one initiative, and I have no idea whether it still exists. I was very happy to uh, one of the lists and I'm on sent me a message of a young Jew and a young Muslim living in Berlin, both of whom got together and said never again means never again. Do something about the Uyghurs. Um, you know, like many initiatives. Um, it bore no visible fruits, but I was glad to see the sentiment. You know, this is realpolitik. Nobody right now knows how to take on China. Um, so, um, you know, the answer is no, but I don't think the Germans are alone in that. You'll see weak protests, but nothing like a serious action. Um, and, you know, to be, uh, you know, to go further in praising to, to some extent, relative to other countries, in praising the German process of Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung, um, I certainly don't mean to say that I, you know, I stand with all of German policy. I think there's a lot more Realpolitik in it um, and a lot less principle than there should be. But unfortunately, that's true of every major power. It's certainly true of the United States. Uh, under whatever administration we're living in. Reparations, um, look, that is such a large question that with four minutes to go, I think, um, you know, I'm gonna have to say, I wrote an entire chapter um, on uh, the question of reparations in my book, Learning from the Germans. It's in paperback, it's not that expensive. If you're interested in the question, um, you should take a look at it. Um, <laughs> It's, uh, uh, yes, it's um, certainly reparations were part of, uh, you know, part of this process of Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung, the original reparations that were offered to survivors and um, to the state of Israel were made in a sort of silent bargain, which actually said, we will pay basically in order to get recognition from the rest of the world, which was still uh, furious, understandably at it. We will pay as long as you don't make us, you know, take all the old Nazis out of office and do any kind of serious Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung. So that's one danger that you can get with reparations is the idea of, well, you know, give them some money and they'll shut up and leave us alone. Um, I think the American situation is really complicated. I think there should be reparations for some things. Um, but what I think, and I, I talk about this in the book, um, what I really think needs to be done both morally and politically is for the United States to realize 
that um, what it calls benefits are considered rights in civilized countries. So things like maternity and paternity leave and healthcare and education and labor laws are considered to be rights. And we consider them to be nice if you can get it, but it's not what you expect from the world. And I think politically, um, the first thing we need to do is to make sure that there's that kind of social justice for every citizen. Um, and then we can talk about what is owed to those citizens who are descendants of slavery and post-slavery and you know, who suffered real material uh, losses as a result of that. So there was one more question, which you don't have time to answer, but I'll just raise it. It's also, it takes us in a different direction entirely, but uh, Siddhartha uh, Banerjee asked, have you thought about why Britain is so resolutely unapologetic about what it did during its empire? And I think that's also another chapter maybe that you might think about writing. Um, I actually, I, yeah, I was, answer? yeah, I was thinking about writing it. Um, when I originally conceived of the book, I wanted it to have three parts and I wanted to have, first I thought about um, Britain and India. The literature on India is so vast and I don't know any Indian languages um, that I thought, well, I'll talk about Britain and Ireland, which I know quite a bit better. And Ireland was after all the first colony and it's got a very complicated history. Um, my editor said the book was already too long and kept, you know, it just, I, I, I did not talk about colonialism. Why? Why do the Brits not do this? It's, it's, it is extraordinary. And yes, I, I, um, I certainly have thought about it and I've talked to, um, you know, many Indians about it. Um, I think if there's an explanation besides the fact that no country really wants to explore its history as a perpetrator, they would always prefer to look at the heroic parts of their history. Um, but I think if there's a historical reason for it, it's the, it's the fact that decolonization happened right after World War II. And the truth of the matter is that Britain was heroic in World War II. And it suffered a lot afterwards because it didn't get the Marshall Plan. So, you know, you had rationing in Britain for a very long time. You had a lot of bombing. And so it was just simply, and then came decolonialization. And yes, people would always rather think of their own heroic, uh, you know, narratives. But in this particular case, it came so quickly that it was very, it was, it was easier for them to ignore what they did in the colonies. But I totally agree that it's quite shocking to listen to um, many, many Brits talking, uh, you know, really knowing virtually nothing about the history of uh, colonialization or crimes that were committed there. Um, you know, if Americans want a, a little Zundenstolz to pat ourselves on the back, we can say, well, we're further along than the Brits are now. Um, <laughs> you still have a way to go. So um, let me just say that um, uh, Chrissy will post the recording um, of this wonderful event on the YouTube channel that is connected with the Jewish Studies program. And maybe she'll send out um, a link to everyone who registered. Um, and, th and with that, we'll say thank you very, very much, Susan Neiman, for this incredibly uh, stirring and powerful talk. Um, I saw somebody raised a hand, but I think it's after 1.30 and you probably need dinner and most of us need lunch. So. Um, Thank you very much. This was fantastic. And I think we'll probably get a bunch of chats saying thank you from many, many people, uh, which we will save as well yes. with the recording. Send them on if you like, and, and thank you. I actually expected more pushback. So I'm glad we're all, you know, kind of living in the same, uh, you know, interesting, 
interesting, uh, complicated uh, circle of thinking about these questions. So it was a pleasure. Thank you for your questions. Thank you. And, uh, and bravo. Bravo. Thank you. Okay. Good night. Good night.